Hey y'all, it's Kate from Litter Apothecary and, and so in my zealousness to clean my computer and make sure there's enough room for all these videos, I accidentally erased almost all of my Outlander vlog check-ins. So you're going to get just a couple that I was able to um, save and then move on to Dragonfly and Amber number two, which we have all of them for. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that, but come to my Discord. The information will be in the description below and talk Outlander with me. And I can't wait to talk about it with all of you guys. Hey y'all, just checking in now on Outlander. I've been listening to this while I've been working. As you can see from my background, I am at work today all week and busy, busy, busy doing stuff for graduation this weekend. But I've been able to listen to some of Outlander's audiobook and we've met Jamie and all of the Highlanders now. And oh my God, it is so funny listening to this woman try to do all of these different Scottish male voices and the accent and everything. You can tell she is clearly um, British. She's got that strong British accent. And the Scottish accent is just so hard to do sometimes. And she's trying to do that along with a male voice, and it's funny. Um, but I think she does, like, Rupert and um, Murtaugh's voice really well so far. She's okay as Jamie, but it's not the same as Sam Hewen being Jamie. So I think it's still a case of being spoiled by the show, but I'm enjoying it a little bit more now that we're in the Scotland 1600s territory. Um, Claire has gone back in time and now she is traveling with Jamie and crew as they think she is an English spy, so they don't want to let her loose. Um, but I'll check in again soon. Thanks. So I'm sitting here at work waiting for students to return the regalia and listening to the audiobook of Outlander and first of all Murtaugh and Claire out as gypsies is just fantastic. I love it so much. It makes me laugh every time. And then this scene with Dougal in that like cave thing. Holy cow Dougal is so crazy and intimidating and he just like wants to just have at it with Claire and I'm like Dude, she is your nephew's wife. Get it together. And that whole scene with Dougal in the cave and Claire is just so intense. I just had to check in about that because holy cow, that's intense. And they did a fantastic job with that, I think, in the TV show. So I think I yeah, just had to check in on those two moments because they are just fantastic. So on this reread of Outlander, I gave it 5 out of 5 stars because I now know the characters because of reading the series and watching the TV show and really studying them. And I, so I don't have my prejudice that I did on the first read. The first read I gave it 4 out of 5 stars because I just couldn't, I, I loved it, but Claire just drove me nuts but now I have a great appreciation for her character and so I was able to appreciate the first book more so than I did on the first read. Um, I can't wait to reread the rest of the series and rewatch the TV shows um, and yeah I'm just be through this reread already I'm just getting a greater appreciation for all of the characters that we have and the writing, the in-depth writing and the research and the combining of fantasy and historical fiction and um, romance and war and politics and all of these heavy topics into such, these are big books, but she, Cabaldin deals with so many different topics that you need a lot of pages in order to be able to write about each one fully so five out of five stars for outlander and now we're going to go into the recipe that i made for this book and then um dragonfly and amber which is number two so one of the fun things that i am going to be doing for my outlander vlogs is making a recipe from our outlander cookbook and at the start of each recipe it has a quote from one of the books and a lot of the Quotes are from book eight, written in my own heart's blood, including the recipe that I wrote, I made today, which is 
Kranich in with Brian and Jenny. And so I'm just going to read this quote off and then I'll show you pictures of what I created. So this is from Written in My Own Heart's Blood, which is book eight. So if you haven't read book eight yet, you can skip ahead to this part. Um, I'll have timestamps in the description below. This is from chapter 52, titled Return to Lollybrock. But where is Bombay? asked the younger of the housemaids, wrinkling her brow and lurking, looking from one face to another. India, said Jenny promptly and pushed back her chair. Sanga, fetch the Kranichin. I, I'll show ye where India is. She vanished through the swinging door and the bustle of removing dishes left Roger with a few moments breathing space. He was beginning to feel a little easier, getting his bearings, though still agonized with worry for Jem. He did spare a moment's thought for William Buckley, but and how Buck might take the news of the date of their arrival. 1730 something? Jesus, Buck himself hadn't even been born yet. But after all, what difference did that make? He asked himself. He hadn't been born yet either and had lived quite happily in a time prior to his birth before. Could their proximity to the beginning of Buck's life have something to do with it though? So now we're gonna skip to the finished product of this because it was a really quick recipe. It's just oats, whiskey, honey, whipped cream, and raspberries, and it is delicious. I've made it a couple times now, and it's so, so good. I will also, um, Put the recipe in my Discord if you want that too. I'm starting book two in Outlander, Dragonfly and Amber right now. I just listened to the prologue on the audiobook and I'm enjoying doing the immersion reading for this because it goes by quicker and it makes it a little bit more enjoyable with a different voice in the head than besides my voice. And this prologue is a really great prologue. If you've seen my videos before, you know I don't really like prologues that much, but I actually enjoy this prologue because it kind of summarizes book one in a way that you still, if you've read book one, you know exactly what it's talking about. But if you haven't read book one, then you definitely need to go back and read book one before you read book two. So I actually enjoyed this prologue and it was short. It was just one page long, which is perfect. Um, so I enjoyed the prologue so far and I'm gonna now get into this book. I actually started listening to this and I'm going back and listening to it with the book in hand um, because I realized I had missed like a whole bunch of the interface between Brianna and Claire and Roger which is obviously in the future um, so I'm gonna go back and listen to that but I forget I forgot that we like jumped straight to having Bri there with us and Roger so um, I'll check in with y'all again soon. Bye. I absolutely love Roger. He's one of my favorite side characters and he's just absolutely fantastic. And to see how he just clings to Brie and just does everything to make her happy and want him is just so endearing to me. I instantly connected with Roger in the books and in the TV show, but more in the book. Um, I loved it see where Roger's story goes from here. He like he even creates a rat song for her, a rat satire, which is the best. I love that scene so much. Hey, rats ye are too many. If ye would dine a plenty, you must go, you must go. Go and fill your bellies. Dinna stay and no my wellies. Go ye rats go So I just finished the first chapter in part two of Dragonfly and Amber, of course, and I noticed a difference between the book and the movie, um, since or in the show, since I have that kind of on my head. So in the show, we saw Jamie and Claire kind of travel to France, and here we, at the end of book one, Outlander, they're planning to go to France, kind of. Um, or they're at the Abbey and they're talking about going to talk to Prince Charlie and um, then we jump to all of a sudden they're in France and they're talking to Jamie's cousin Jared. So in the show we get a little bit more of their sea travel and we see Jamie being seasick and in the book it's kind of only talked about. 
but it's not a big difference. It's just something I noticed while I was reading. So the moment that Claire finds what we're supposed to believe is Jamie's grave with Brianna and Roger there is just such a precious moment. I have to read it out to you because my words won't do it justice without it. Uh, so this is on page 76 of my edition here, this paperback. Claire's fingers brushed his own away and touched the stone caressing as though touching flesh gently tracing the letters the grooves worn shallow but still clear james alexander malcolm mackenzie fraser she read aloud yes i know him her hand dropped lower brushing back the grass that grew thickly about the stone obscuring the line of smaller letters at its base. Beloved husband of Claire, she read. Yes, I knew him, she said again, so softly Roger could scarcely hear her. I'm Claire. He was my husband, she looked up then. Into the face of her daughter, white and shocked above her, and your father, she said. And that moment of revelation for Claire to tell Brianna there with Roger there was like, we've been working up for the first, you know, 76 pages of this book, but to, uh, for her to actually do it at his grave, at that random churchyard with Jonathan Randall outside, buried outside is just so huge. And I feel like this is where I think the TV show might have dropped the ball a little from what I remember, and I'm going to do a rewatch, of course, but from what I remember, Brianna kind of already knew about Jamie, sort of, before they got to Scotland, so it kind of takes away that huge, momentous moment and the feeling and all of that magic in it, but the writing in these books is just, I love the shows, but you can't beat the writing in these books. It's just so good, so good. So I just met Sir Raymond, Master Raymond, and... Uh, if you have ever considered putting your medical talents to use, L'Hôpital des Anges is always looking for help. What is L'Hôpital des Anges? A charity hospital. And he's such a dear character to me. He's one of my favorites from Dragonfly and Amber, and I've missed him dearly so it's nice to be able to meet him again and we get to see a bunch of him in this book so I can't wait to see more of him and I just had to check in on that because he's one of my favorites so I was just listening as I was driving home from work today and we just met Fergus and I miss Fergus as a little boy oh my gosh I miss him so much Anyways, I just had to check in really quick about that because when you meet a new character that you know you love, you have to check in. So I love Fergus and I forgot we met him in this book, so I can't wait to see him grow up now. Right, let's take Myrtle with you. Fergus too. Have her home in time to dress for dinner if you expect to eat yourself. You have my word. So I just got to the point in Dragonfly and Amber where Jamie and Claire are in France. They're at the um, King's Prince Charlie's party and they've just run into Jack Randall. He has suffered a lot of trauma at the hands of Black Jack Randall and ultimately Jamie finds a new life in the fact that he's going to be able to seek revenge on the man that, that caused all this. I challenged him to a duel. He accepted. He said he owed me a death. Um, they thought he was dead this whole time. They thought he died back at the prison. Turns out he's still alive. And I think, like, in the back of her mind, Claire knew this because she knew the death date and where Jack Randall died. But I think she also was both trying to convince herself and Jamie that he was really dead so they can move on from that event that happened at prison. Um, but now they've seen him alive and I just reached the end of that chapter where at the very end of the chapter they find out he's alive and 
holy cow, this is going to get so good. Ah! I'm so excited. I love these characters so much. I just love them so much. So I just read the chapter where um, Bonnie Prince Charlie goes onto the roof and essentially comes into Claire and Jamie's bedroom in the middle of the night because he got bit by his mistress's monkey. No lies, an m actual monkey. And this scene is just so outrageous. And then Claire tells Jamie about how she got her legs waxed and Jamie like freaks out and then she says, well, it could have been worse because this other girl, uh, Luis, she got everything wax and he's like even the honey pot and i'm like just him calling it the honey pot is hilarious but jamie's reaction about like modern women taking care of themselves kind of deal is hilarious because he's like why would you do that i'm hairy i have no problem being hairy and claire's like well you're a man you're supposed to be hairy women aren't supposed to be and just first of all the social norms there and the expectations um that kind of went from everyone's just natural to Claire's time where only the men can be hairy to now it's kind of in the middle where some women just let it go when some are still like I need to be shaved or waxed or whatever. Um, it's just interesting seeing those different dimensions playing out. So we see the different times of Claire and Jamie and where they're from play out in their relationship and the whole monkey bite scene is still hilarious. But that's it for now. Today is day one of the Il Mix Readathon on Shelf Space, and I've been listening to the audiobook while I've been doing other things, running errands and picking walks and stuff. And I've got just a couple things to say. First, I love Bhutan so much. He's such a cute pup. Bravo, tu as trouvé, Bhutan. Ah, Bhutan, I love you. Um, second, I love this intrigue that we get, of course, of Charles and James, of who's going to be King of Scotland. It's so great. And the idea of using sheet music as a key, a, a, a secret language kind of, is just absolutely fascinating to me. I remember reading this for the first time and thinking, what an amazing, ingenious idea. So, those are my thoughts there. Um, I will check in with y'all again soon. Bye. So I just listened to the chapter where Claire and Mary get kind of assaulted in the alleyway and Mary gets raped and then they get back home and they have to put on a face. Oh my god, that chapter is so hard to read or listen to, but she did such a fabulous job with that chapter. Uh, kudos to Diana Gabaldon. You're a pro. Uh, yeah. When Claire loses their baby because she's so worried about Jamie and his duel with Jack Black, Blackjack, oh my god. That is just heartbreaking. I know several people have had miscarriages, but to have to go through that and worry about your husband and well, really both of your husbands, because if Jamie kills blackjack then frank won't exist and if blackjack kills jamie then well we know S that scene is just oh it hits my heart so so freaking much i like the show doesn't do it justice because of depression and the inner turmoil that claire goes through losing her baby you can't really get that a lot in film in visual that's something that works much better in um, print where you can expand on a character's thoughts without having to have that character say it out loud. If, it, if it's in film, they have to really say it or, um, you know, voiceover. So that those moments with Claire makes me actually like Claire a little bit more. She's not my favorite character, but those moments with her and Ra Master Raymond, those make me... A little bit more sympathetic to Claire as a character. So not only does Claire have to deal with the miscarriage and Jamie's 
going out and dueling Jack Randall, but now he's in prison and she had to go to the King of France and basically offer up her body for Jamie's release. And that turned into either essentially condemning Saint Germain or Master Raymond to their death for witchcraft. And that is just, that whole scene in that secret room was amazing. Like, whew, so intense, so hard to read or watch on the screen. So unbelievable. And now she's just learned why Jamie went against his word and dueled Jack Randall because Jack Randall went after Fergus who's like a son to them and holy cow this is just getting so intense I forgot how intense this book was um but yeah that's it for now it is freaking hot outside which is why my face is so red I just went to the library and I was my body skin was so hot it didn't pass the temperature check the first time they had to do it again um, but I just had to check in because the way that Diana Gabaldon handles the grief that Jamie and Claire go through for their child that was in the miscarriage is amazing. It doesn't get enough attention, but those moments between them are so real and so heartbreaking and heart rendering and it just makes you feel those for those characters so much and I just had to check in on that because I was listening to it in the car and it made me start to cry so yeah kudos on that to catch up on I am making really great progress in Dragonfly and Amber and we're now leading up to Culloden we've done, gone through Prestopans and we've seen Jamie's honor with his fellow soldiers, his people um, from Lallybrock that he has to bring to fight for Charles, he will do anything for them before he takes help for himself and that's his honor in him and I, you know, of course respect him for that. I mean, he had a gash in his side from a sword and he hid it from Claire knowing she would force him to get help and helped all of his men first before he got help for himself. Um, and then we see this whole scene with Colm talking about how he has to choose what Dougal and his men do, fight for Charles or go back home. Jamie has this like secret conversation with Claire between their eyes and she tells him, you know, essentially to save his family. And Jamie tells Colm to tell his men to go back home and then uh, Colm's death his suicide because he was in so much pain he couldn't take it anymore and he asked Claire to help him end his own life and whew, that scene is just so hard breaking. I hate seeing anyone in pain like that, but man, that, as you can see, that's bringing me to tears just talking about it, so I'm going to end it there, and I'll check in with y'all again soon. Bye. Okay, chapter 45, so much, so much to check in on. First, we've got the Duke of Sandringham, and he is, like, apparently Claire's captor. You know, we've got the Falkirk skirmish, and Claire has to basically pretend that she's held captive by Jamie and crew and she is turned over to the English for their freedom and they take her to the Duke of Sandringham who we had no idea he was there to begin with and Mary Hawkins is there because Sandringham is his, her godfather and he's got this new husband lined up so we've got all that going on. Jamie comes and rescues them both and they bring Hugh Monroe's body to his family because he was the kind of homeless beggar that helped them out a couple times and he was trying to help Claire get away and that he got caught and hung and then when we're at his family's house 
uh, Murtaugh brings in the head of Sandringham. So Sandringham is dead now and beheaded, which was a crazy realization. And then Mary brings Claire and Jamie to Alex Randall, who, if you don't remember, is Jack Randall's brother. And essentially, he makes Jack promise that Jack will take care of his son because Mary is pregnant with Alex's kid. And then he forces it, like, Randall and Mary get married there right before Alex dies. And this is kind of where we learn of the true origin of Frank Randall. Um, Jack kind of took Mary's baby and pretended it was his own in all the records and everything. And that's how we thought that Frank was descendant from Jack Randall, but really he's descended from Alex Randall. So all that Al all that Jamie did to kind of keep Jack Randall alive, um, all that she he did to keep Jack Randall alive this whole time was basically for nothing. So this is turning into crazy and I'm almost to the end. Less than a hundred pages and whew, I can't wait to see where else it goes before we get on to book three. So now Jamie has clear killed Dougal and he's on the run. He's taken Claire back to Craig Nadoon to send her back in time because she's pregnant with his baby and he doesn't want her to be in the middle of all of this. He's going back to surrender himself to Dougal's men and they've got, you know, Culloden looming up and this whole goodbye scene is just make gets to me every single time they are just saying goodbye claire says mark me she gives her, her hand he makes a little j in him and she makes a c in his hand and goodbye claire It's just, he says, name the baby Brian after my dad, and it just, it gets to me every single time. It's so well written, and then they have to rush at the end because English come, and it's just so well written. Now I'm down on the last part of the book, so I'm going to push ahead and finish today, but oh man, so well done. My mind is absolutely blown right now. Um, so I've read this book now twice. I'm just about at the end, 50 pages left. And I've seen the show and it only just clicked in my head right before Claire revealed it that Roger is actually Gillis in Dougal's like, descendant. And this just blew my mind. How did I not remember this? I was just like, wait a minute, she's leading up to this, I think. And then I went and commented it on my Discord, so I had it there before I went on to read it. And I just read where she says, yes, you are from Gaelis Duncan. And I'm like, holy cow, she's like, you have his eyes. And my mind is just blown at this thought. Like, everything makes sense now. Everything makes sense. I think I, like, was thinking this when I first read it, but... It's only now that it really, really makes sense to me. And I'm just like, wow. Wow. <laughs> so, I just finished Dragonfly and Amber book two. And my mind is so blown about the whole Roger Galis Dougal thing. This is just makes total sense and it's crazy. And also hints at kind of incest in future books. But we will just forget about that for the moment. Um, but holy cow, this book has so much in it. Five, five stars, five stars, five star trumpet, jump it, I don't care. This book is only book two and so far my favorite in this series because it covers so much and it's written so well. Ah, I am, can't wait to get on to book three, Voyager. This book was just so well written had so many emotions all the emotions it had so many different topics murder time travel war 
birth um, miscarriage, love, cheating, sleeping with other people, like it just covered everything. Espionage. It's, it, it was so good. So freaking good. So good. Hey y'all, thanks for sticking by in this reading vlog for Dragonfly and Amber. Now I'm going to be talking about the recipe that we're going to be trying out today. I'm so excited to try this recipe out. As you know, it comes from Outlander Kitchen, the cookbook. I am loving this cookbook so much and I can't wait to try even more recipes. Today's recipe is actually a drink recipe because it has been so hot here. I can't wait to try this cool drink. It's called Whiskey and Coconut Milk and our quote comes from actually one of the side books that Diana Gabaldon wrote. It's called Lord John and the Private Matter. This is one of the novellas featuring Lord John Gray. And our quote says, India, I heard, Lady Mumford went on, frowning slightly as she fingered the cloth of his uniform sleeve. Now you'll have your new uniform ready, or ready ordered, I hope. A nice tropical weight of super fine for your coat and waistcoat and linen breeches. You don't want to be spending a summer under the Indian sun, swaddled to the neck in English wool. Take it from me, my dear. I went with Mumford when he was posted there in 35. Both of us nearly died. Between the heat, the flies, and the food. Spent a whole summer in me shift, having the servants pour water over me. Poor old Wally wasn't so fortunate. Sweating about in full uniform. Never could get the stains out. Drank nothing but whiskey and coconut milk. Bear that in mind, dear, when the time comes. Nourishing and stimulating, you know and so much more wholesome to the stomach than brandy wine. Like I said, that comes from Lord John and The Private Matter, a really fun um, novella, a side project that Diana Gabaldon started with all these Lord John Gray novels. Um, so this drink uh, includes simple syrup, chai tea, coconut milk, whiskey, Crushed ice is optional and lime twist for garnish and I can't wait to try this out. So the first step in our whiskey and coconut milk drink is to make the simple syrup which is just an easy recipe with just sugar and water done to the right temperature. Um, so here is our simple syrup recipe and we're going to get in on this and let it chill so then we can go back and make the drink later. So we're just going to heat this on medium heat until all the sugar dissolves because that's what the recipe says to do. And now we turn it up high until it boils. And while our simple syrup is cooling down, we are going to put our tea bags into the liquids so they can seep in there as it's cooling down. And we're just going to let it sit in there until it cools down for a little bit. So now our simple syrup and chai tea have chilled for a while and now we are whisking together one cup of coconut milk with that until smooth and then we'll add the whiskey and now we're going to slowly add in eight ounces of whiskey to this and then we'll chill it for another hour so it all can mix together continuously so they said use crushed ice, but I'm just using on the rocks instead, and it is delicious. Come to my Discord where I will have the recipe there. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, keep reading, and I love you all to the moon and back.
拜。